Greetings Gatehouse Insiders. In this episode, I'm speaking with Josh, who is inspiring young people to pursue with purpose through his story of being a 12-year-old kid on the brink of suicide to a driven 16-year-old creative entrepreneur of a group of businesses. Make sure you subscribe to the Gatehouse Legal Recruitment YouTube channel to catch it all. So you left school at 14 years old to start your own businesses um, and you're now 16. So tell us about that, that journey so far. Well, it's, it's been a process, but I left, started my, I wouldn't really call it a business, but that's how I sort of started in business at around the age of 12, nearing the age of 13. And it started as a, a small photography business. And it, it, it eventually, as I moved on in high school, or starting high school, I sort of looked at it and I was like, how could I take this business to the the biggest it could ever be in the shortest amount of time? Um, and obviously there were quite a lot of time constraints being in a, a six hour school day in between everything. So every hour in between school and on weekends, I, I really worked on developing this, this small photography business and I wanted to see it turn into a, a creative agency that would be able to innovate visually um, within the Melbourne region. And I was able to see that and work with people and hire people who were able to achieve that and in a really good way grew it a lot faster than I expected but with that came growing pains considering I was also spending six hours a day at high school while trying to run a full-time business. And it got to the point where it was either no sleep for a week and finish the business and meet deadlines or um, make some plan with school and it, it got to a point at around 14 years old like you said where it was a more viable option to go into the real world and the education was much more valuable in everything that I was doing as opposed to your normal high school curriculum and that sort of made the decision to take the jump and go for it and my mom's a school teacher so it was a process and my dad works in education as well yeah. so it was a huge process but in the end it worked out. And they've obviously supported you. How was their yeah. initial response when you said I want to do this full yeah. time? Yeah well we're originally at the age of seven I immigrated from South Africa mm -hmm. to Australia and coming from that immigrant mindset with my parents it's, it's go to school, go to university, get a good job and settle in the new country and it's, it's I never found myself to fit in with that form and I could never see myself going through that whole process and, and living life within the normal constraints and my parents saw that but obviously it was hard because all my mom's known her whole life is, is teaching and I can't blame her for it um, but it was, a, it was a slow change of heart but as they saw a more valuable education in the real world they sort of released me into it. And you've just, um, or I don't know if you've just launched an online retail business. Yeah, last year. Last year. Tell us more about that. So that's a uh, online fashion e-commerce business for, well, millennial-based fashion for both men and women. Uh, so it's called Gentleman Australia, and the idea with it is to, at least within the Australian market, is to change the way how my generation, at least, approaches fashion. I think with new technology that's coming along and this is really where gentlemen is going into using artif artificial intelligence and virtual reality uh, to be able to get custom made tailored clothing without the custom made tailored clothing price point. So that's really where gentlemen is moving in toward. Right now we are still moving in toward that product line with still doing your sort of preset um, normal outfits and fashion and watches and accessories. but. It's really with the end goal to be able to change the way how millennials shop for fashion online and rather than just buying your normal preset sizes which kind of fits you, kind of doesn't, be able to get something that's exactly tailored to you without that price point. Can you explain how virtual reality will work? Mm. It's, it's absolutely incredible because the amount of time that it's taken within the past 10 years it's absolutely exploded. So for example, there's already technology out there and there's software that we're not developing from ground up for gentlemen, but actually just building on and improving on that basically you 
rotate, you put your f iPhone on a floor, on a level surface, and you basically put your hands up like this and rotate around, and it gets measurements of your entire body from head to toe, 20% more accurate than the tailor. And this was done through testing with having multiple tailors in a room measuring the same suit for the same person as opposed to the camera measuring the same suit for the same person. And the virtual reality is essentially, I think, in the future and in the very near future, next five years, is going to become a extension of how we approach technology and information, but also this extension of our brains and how we, how we go about everyday life. So I know when we spoke over the phone, you mentioned that at 12 years old you were, you were facing depression mm. and, and suicidal. What made you realise that you were in that state and what actually prompted you to take action? Mm. Well, the, I think at age 12 it was the, the culmination of everything. So moving from one country to another does a lot to you in itself. Um, but it really didn't hit me until the age of 12. Um, as well as my, my family as a whole, culturally, financially, uh, emotionally and mentally. And that was sort of the culmination of where everything just sort of came together um, in the worst way possible, really. And I, I always reference, I will always have a really vivid image in my mind at the age of 12. Uh, it was around midnight sitting on the edge of my bed. And I, I got to this breaking point and I googled what is the easiest way to kill yourself because I was at this dead end in my life solely because I, I know I was so young and I didn't know all the answers to life but I didn't see a way in which my life had a purpose to benefit others and I didn't realise this at the age of 12 but looking back on it I can see that now. And a few weeks or say months down the line it was a process from being on the brink of suicide to, to wanting to realise what my purpose in life was. But a few months along the, down the line, I, I sort of made this decision and that was a real turning point and was probably in the course of a, a few months. And I decided that my purpose was I wanted to be a resourcer. I wanted to be able to resource other people and, and projects and communities. And I saw this as the best possible way to live my life and count my life and my legacy towards something that was greater than just myself. Again, going back to that, that immigrant mindset, I didn't want to live in the constraints of only benefiting myself and my family. I saw so much potential with, with what I had and what I was given, um, and that was the real turning point for me. Yeah. How did you go about finding your purpose? Yeah, it's a, it's a really uh, important question, but that's why I'm so grateful for, in the weirdest way possible, being, going through that experience with being on the brink of suicide is because at, at some point in our lives, whether it's today or whether it's next week or next month or next year, we go through suffering that may be caused by us or may not be caused by us. It's, it's inevitable, it happens to everyone. But there's this, this old historical religious concept, whether you believe in a religion or not, but it's this, this concept of rebirth, dying to your old self and your, your old set of values and your old set of knowledge and being rebirthed to a new, wiser, smarter you. But the only way that can happen is going through those, the deep end of life is what I like to call it, going through the hard and difficult times and in those times you get pushed and your set of values gets, I guess, pushed into this hierarchy, what do you value the most and what don't you value the most? And then your life and when you're going through these difficult experiences, you put everything into a greater context of your, your entire life. Now in Australia, youth suicide rates and mental health issues are mm. increasing. What's your view on it and why do you think it's so high? Yeah, I was reflecting on this question last night and I have this, this piece of paper in front of my computer in my bedroom and, and in my office. And it's a, it was a 2017 study that's recently been republished with even more shocking statistics, but I'll go off more of an average, the 2017 study. And it shows that teenagers spend around nine hours a day in front of screens. 
but they spend around 1,200 hours a year on social media, just scrolling through social media. And that's, you sort of think 1,200 hours, well in the context of a year, that's, that's not that much. But I decided to do a bit of math with it. And the average lifespan of an Australian at least is around 82.45 years, Let's say 83 years. You take that and you take a, our generation's social media scrolling use and you put that into the, uh, from the age of 12, 13 to the age of 83. You take that and you, you sort of realise how much time you spend on social media. It's 9.72 years scrolling through social media. It's a lot of years. <laughs> and touching back on mental health and, uh, and suicide rates, we're the first generation, or at least, yes we are, that ha have phones as essentially this extension of our brain in this, this age of information and technology, which is amazing. We have the past thousand years of information and history um, in, in a tiny $400 iPhone. But the problem with, with now social media is not social media in itself, is how we as a generation are trying to approach it because it's such a new concept and um, looking at a historical sort of timeline and we're the first generation to try to figure out how do we put this social media and this technology and our phones and this information into the context of our life. How do we use this to the best of our abilities? And we're still getting there but it's, it's going to take a while. And the problem now with, with, with social media and this increased use is we're using social media daily more than we often talk to anyone that we know, whether it be our family or, or best friends, which is shocking because the problem with social media is that you, you take your everyday life and your mundane everyday responsibilities and life and you compare it to someone's highlight reel on Instagram or Facebook, which for a young person is extremely damaging, especially when you're going through the developing stages, it it's, does something to your brain and we don't know the full extent to which it can harm someone, but we're beginning to see it in uh, a decade high youth suicide rate in Australia and now New Zealand becoming one, I just saw the other day, New Zealand has become one of the highest youth suicide rates in the world. It's, it's shocking. That is shocking. Mm. Do people realise or does the, the generation um, that you're in, do they realise that it's not necessarily real and it, some of it's, a lot of it's fake or people are just showing the best aspects of their life? Well, it's hard because how do you differentiate reality from what you see on social media? Because it's easy to, uh, how would you say it, it's easy to make a facade on social media that you you live this like, like this way every day and, and this highlight reel is in reality your your everyday life and that's a really important question because it's and on a day-to-day -day basis I work in and manage Instagram influencers and Facebook influencers and it's a really hard question because the dangerous part of it is we don't want to distort reality through social media so it looks like this is a potential reality that, that a young person can look up to because you're promoting these impossible, uh, never to be reached standards on social media and someone is trying to say, well, how can I, I reach that in my everyday life? And it's difficult, yeah. But touching on purpose and pursuit, um, why do you think it's so important to help with mental health issues? Yeah, I mean, I think I have a really strong belief that our dreams and our purpose choose us, we don't choose them. It's just our, I guess, responsibility in life to find the purpose and the dream that was predestined for us. And it's funny that once you, once you decide that you want to commit your life to something greater than yourself and you want to spend your life being able to benefit or at least make a tiny bit of a positive impact in the world. It's funny how things tend to align themselves and that was with my case with mental health. 
it was because, and everyone has something that's, that's close to their heart or something that they've experienced or a family member's experienced that, and that, that they're passionate about. And when you decide to live your life in a way which positively impacts the lives of other people, your passions begin to, and, and what you really love, um, begin to reveal themselves and sort of align for you to be able to pursue. In my case, it was mental health. And I think from my perspective, it's, it's really important to, to help with that through my purpose, just because the statistics are showing that nothing else is getting to, through to young people. And I don't think I have the answers at all, but the best thing I can do is, is try to find one. I want to just touch on confidence and building confidence, because mm. a lot of um, young Australians, even adults, they, mm. they lack that confidence. You're quite confident. How did you build it up? <laughs> um, it's hard because I, I think the, I think the, and I can only really speak for my generation exclusively because that's all I know. Uh, but I think we sometimes, and I think this is also the social media and everything, we sometimes um, blur the lines between uh, self-confidence that has humility versus a, an arrogant self-confidence a, and a narcissistic self-confidence. And for me, the way I found how to develop self-confidence with myself personally, and I think this is a really valuable set of guidelines that someone can go about finding um, how to have a sort of firm foundation and, and uh, improve their self-confidence, is that you choose, you be really wise and you choose your circle of who you want to take advice from and who you want to uh, listen to. And I would recommend choosing people that you um, would never want to turn into people that not that you really hate but people that you see and you're like I'd never want my life to, to turn into that um, bad examples as well as the best examples people you look at their lives and you're like if my life could reach anywhere near that that would be amazing and like like you said listening to their stories and listening to their experience on both ends of the spectrum bad and good failures and successes you begin to sort of develop a, a list of advice they could give you even if you aren't able to talk with them in person you can sort of uh, develop a mental list of what's worked for them and what hasn't and how that can sort of apply to your life but then also on the point of self-confidence is that I think for my generation exclusively it's really looking how to find your approval within yourself rather than looking for it in other people. And I think that's also where how we use social media becomes really damaging because we, on that point of the highlight reel and distorting reality with, with um, fiction, you sort of, with social media, you, you try to convey yourself in a way that other people will approve and accept. And it becomes dangerous when that's all you rely on is other people's feedback and your values and your uh, founda foundational values and ethics are swayed by what other people think today or tomorrow because that's constantly changing. So I would, I would say develop a firm set of foundational values, place it into a list of what do you value the most and what do you value the least and go about life and listen to feedback based on those set of values and once in a while uh, try to challenge those set of values. Look at somebody who has a completely um, opposing set of beliefs to you or, or values to you and try to see their um, perspective in that. You make an interesting point about people are seeking approval from others as mm. opposed to intern within and um, just on I suppose social media or Instagram um, a friend she's a lawyer she said that she went off Instagram because she was hanging she was spending some time with um, influencers on, on social and she said they would go and travel to particular mm. destinations and they'd spend hours traveling just to take a picture just to take a picture and then they leave and they don't actually get to experience or enjoy what was around them mm. and she said that 
these people would then post and if they didn't get the amount of likes or amount of get engagement, they'd feel really down and depressed mm. and hard on themselves. Mm. And that's so funny because it's the word influencer in itself, they have the audience to provide the influence and the fact that they're getting down on the, the amount of likes they have on social media is really telling of well, what are they going to give to their audience. Correct. <laughs> it was just interesting. She said it now like that you've touched a lot of do and I, we do see it a lot of people are, ex are getting or wanting approval from others because mm. it's going to make them feel better. Yeah. Yeah. So. And it's a hard thing to get over because obviously it's, it's when it's good, it's easy to, to use that validation as confidence, but that, that's all fine. But when it's bad and when it's all going wrong and when people don't like you on social media, you're not getting as much likes as you want um, or as much attention as you want. If your self-confidence and your uh, hierarchy of values is based on that, it's extremely dangerous to yourself. It is. Yeah. What do you think, as people like get older and, and move on and mm. go, how, how are they going to handle it? <laughs> how do you think they'll handle it? It's a hard thing because I don't think it's a solution that we're going to find within the next uh, 10 years, maybe 100 years. Um, that's, again, after my generation would be, for the most part, past. Uh, so I think it's our responsibility to navigate social media with a bit more caution and a bit more context into our everyday lives. Um, but I think as a generation we're still, we're still trying to f see how social media and how this overload of information that we receive every single day fits into our everyday life. And I think a lot of people go on what's called like an information diet where they um, go off social media, even if it's just for a month or a few, I would recommend minimum of a month, but even for a few weeks. Um, and it really puts everything into perspective with you. And then you go back onto social media with a, um, even if it's a slightly changed, but still changed perspective on how you approach everything. I find it so interesting that now we've got social media diets, that we, we're taking some time off social yeah. and they're coming back on. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, but it is, it is what it is. Yeah. Now, I know you've recently done a TED Talk about your story. Mm. Um, can you, um, it hasn't been released, is hasn't that correct? Released, okay. yeah. <laughs> Can oh, you yeah. share some tips or like some advice you gave mm. through that TED Talk? Yeah, well that was talking about, some of what we've been talking about today is from how I went from being on the brink of suicide to finding my purpose and, and pursuing that. And I mean, from a really practical viewpoint, the one of the first, uh, rules that I use sort of in everyday life um, with, with the business specifically and with, with goal setting is um, the, the 10 times rule sort of derived by a man named Grant, Grant Cardone, yes, which I'm is a <laughs> successful uh, real estate entrepreneur. And it's a, it's a crazy, um, I guess, idea because you're not taking your, essentially the concept is you take your really ambitious goal for the next 12 months at least and you you don't multiply it by two or by three or by four, but you, you 10 times it and you add a, an extra few zeros to whatever you're, um, whatever you're setting or whatever you're, you're trying to achieve. And the idea in that is not sacrificing everything in order to uh, achieve that, that 10 times goal. It's to change your mindset in that everyday, in your everyday thinking. So you, you see, Setting a goal for 12 months is easy. Setting a really ambitious goal that you would love to achieve um, and 10 times in it is easy. But then you take that, that goal ha that has been multiplied and is absolutely audacious and uh, really you don't think you can ever reach it and you take it into an everyday level and you're like, how can I use today and then tomorrow and then next week to take a step forward toward that goal? And that's the mindset that it teaches you. And even if you don't reach the 10 times goal by the end of the year, it's much better to be failing at that 10 times goal and succeeding from your initial goal than failing at the initial goal. So it really teaches you how to outsource tasks that don't require you specifically and your 
uh, intelligence and perspective, as well as your own actions and other people's actions. How can you 10 times it and, and really multiply it on an everyday basis? That's what it's really taught me, yeah. And that is all for now. But don't fear, because I'll be back next week speaking to more inspiring people. Thank you for watching and thank you for sharing this video with your friends. And as always, make sure you subscribe to the Gatehouse Legal Recruitment YouTube channel to see more.